presentation on Pinball 2000, and I hope that both of our Pinball 2000 uh, guys are ready. This is going to be a short presentation, half hour or so, and at the end of it we'll have question and answer. So if you have any questions regarding the presentation, let me know and I'll walk around and give you the mic and hopefully we'll get an answer. I'd like to introduce the people who are giving this presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, somebody who has worked for Midway and Williams and Bally now as a game designer all together for maybe 12 years as an employee and also has worked an ind as an independent uh, for the company as well. Um, he has uh, released a lot of wonderful games. First one was Corvette, Monster Bash as well. And he's one of the co-inventors of Pinball 2000. Please welcome George Gomez. Thanks, Jim. And uh, everybody knows uh, Larry as well, I would assume. This is Larry DeMar, who has been with us for 19 years, approximately. Is that correct? That's correct. 19 years. He doesn't look like he could be that old. I'm eligible for parole in three months. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Larry is the director of engineering for Pinball. That means for Williams and Bally Games. And uh, he is uh, one of the co-creators of Pinball 2000. So please welcome Larry DeMar. Jim. Thanks, Jim. Take it away. All right. Now, now that everybody's had a chance to actually play Revenge from Mars, uh, you can see the uh, magic of Pinball 2000, uh, which is the seamless integration of traditional pinball with all of the excitement, flexibility, interactivity, and depth that we can provide uh, using video virtual images um, to interact with the pinball. We're going to spend a few minutes here to show you what's inside Pinball 2000 and how this new revolutionary system works. And we're going to show you, at the same time, some new ways to think about pinball and some new ways to operate your pinballs. Am I uh, You're on. that noise You're coming on. from? I uh, can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to run through a couple scenarios. Uh, for the first one, I am the uh, operator. I've placed a Revenge from Mars in George's tavern. Um, a player has just come over to George and said, hey, George, there's a ball trapped on the play field. Uh, before Pinball 2000, George would call me, and I'd have to call Fred. Now, Fred is my technician with attitude. So I call up Fred, and uh, it uh, got me out of bed at uh, 1, 1 p.m. Wh what are you calling me at this terrible time? So I convince Fred to go to the location. He drives 50 miles, frees up the ball, charges me $75, and the game's been down for four hours. Uh, with Pinball 2000, we introduce what's called the location key. I give the location key to George, the bar owner. He goes into a new lock on the front of the cabinet. He can remove the hand protector and glass, and now he can service the game, free the trapped ball, whatever other minor maintenance or issue might be necessary. We all know while, while George is in there, he's going to take the money too, but the play field remains locked firmly in place, so there's no access to the cash box the auditing data, the electronics, or anything under the play field. Okay, we're going to switch the scenario a little bit. Um, I'm still operating this game, but George is my collector, so now he's going to come to collect the money from the game. So he uses the regular key to the front door. All right, and now there's a release for the hand protector, so you don't have to go to that extra key. It's a, an additional release. And now magically the play field uh, is free and comes up. It's done through this passive lockdown device. When the coin door is closed, it automatically locks the play field in place. And this allows this location key system to work because I don't have to rely on the collector or the technician to remember to lock that play field down. When he closes the game, the play field's locked. When he opens the game, uh, he has access to the play field. While George is there collecting the game, he notices there's a fault. The ball won't kick out of the ball popper. Now, George is a really wonderful collector. He's a hell of a game designer, but I wouldn't let him near a soldering iron to save my life. So um, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, look at a little different way of uh, doing this. Before Pinball 2000, ball poppers are dead. George calls me. I call Fred. 
Fred's got a date tonight. Don't bother me. I can't get out there. Twist his arm, offer him extra compensation. Fred drives down to the location, gets to the game, diagnoses the problem, realizes he doesn't have the part. So he goes home, comes back the next day with the part, fixes the game. Game's been down a uh, day and a half. Fred's charged me $150 and given me an awful lot of attitude. Um, again, with Pinball 2000, we want to change the way that you think about pinball. I operate 10 Revenge from Mars games, and I keep an 11th play field in George's truck. So um, to fix a, a minor fault on a game or even a major fault on a play field, you don't need to be a technician. You just need to be able to follow a couple of easy steps. Um, is there anyone in the audience here, and I know we have some technicians uh, here for our seminar this afternoon, uh, who has changed a play field on a pinball game, taken the play field out, wiring harnesses, the whole thing out to put a new play field in or to service it? Can I see a hand of someone who's changed one? How, How long, long does take? it take? Well okay, for... Yeah, pull the connectors off, get the play field Routing out. Routing them out of the back box. Okay. Okay. Hour or two project. We've had responses from 45 minutes all the way to three hours to change out a conventional pinball play field. Um, one of the operators said when he has to do it, he gets out his wire cutters. <laughs> so um, <coughs> with Pinball 2000, we want to show you a new way to think and a new way to operate your game. So if we have the help of our timekeeper... Is our timer ready? We have a magical timekeeper in the sky. Uh -huh. All right. Well, uh, um, George, our collector, is For now going record. to swap out this play field. The world, well, we'll talk about the world record in a moment, but we'll see how long it takes him. On your mark, get set, go. The first thing you notice is this skid rail system. It literally allows one person to pretty effortlessly just slide the play field out of the cabinet. On the back of the play field, there are six uniquely keyed connectors, and at the 11 second mark, the first play field is completely removed from the game. We, we are uh, on a world record pace here. To put the new play field in, you just reverse the process. The connectors go back on, and you notice we're, even, we're doing this live. Um, no problem. Connectors go back on, play field slides in on the skid rails back into the cabinet, 33. We have a new world record coming, 37 seconds, and we have replaced a play field on a pinball machine. Previous world record was 43 seconds. Jim Shirt is going to be distraught to hear his <laughs> record's been broken. All right, now... We showed you how this is a good way for you to do your service on location. George will now take the faulty play field back to the shop. It goes to Fred, and Fred on his own time can get to it and fix it. Fred will also have the lighting that he needs instead of being in a dark tavern. He will have the tools that he's used to using all in his shop, and he'll have rep whatever replacement parts he needs. While the play field is in the shop, Fred can wax it, do any other preventative uh, maintenance, updating, and put it back in the truck and now this can either be used to rotate into the next game when it has a problem or just for preventative maintenance you can swap the play fields out. These interchangeable play fields um, have other really good purposes. Um, you can apply generic side art to your Pinball 2000 cabinet. It's a beautiful decal with Pinball 2000 logo and then with your multiple games on location, instead of rotating furniture, you can rotate your equipment by just moving play fields. You take the play field, the back glass translite, and the software card from one game, rotate it to the next, and in minutes, um, you can rotate these games, and you can move the play field in a car instead of movers in a truck. So this gives you a new way to think about rotating your equipment. It's going to take you longer to drive to the location than it is to do the swap at the location. Um, Translite, software, play field in a little bit longer than you saw me if you're taking your time. Okay, and then the, uh, the next uh, advantage that this play field system provides us is the Pinball 2000 system is a convertible system. And each Pinball 2000 cabinet will accept any Pinball 2000 play field that allows you to rotate the equipment as we just described, giving your players um, more variation more often, but it also allows you to update these games down the road 
and this gives you a better return on investment. You can reuse the cabinet, the monitor, the electronics, and buy a play field kit and convert the game, improving your ROI. Every game will be produced as both a dedicated by the entire platform or as a kit. So you can, when you get a kit, you don't, uh, you don't just put software in the game. You're, you're going to get a play field, you're going to get translite and art, and you're going to get software. That's essentially a Pinball 2000 kit. All right, and uh, George is going to take the play field out again, uh, something that used to be a chore. We just go, uh, you know, in and out, and it's really fun to service your pinballs now. And we're going to look into the cabinet. Inside the cabinet for easy access um, is the power driver board, and we've got a good shot of it. Um, right down here, you can hopefully see clearly there's a row of red LEDs. There's an LED next to each fuse, which indicates the status of that fuse. This means if you have a problem with the game, you can, through the uh, front door, raise the play field, look at that row of lights, and see right away, is it a fuse problem, and immediately which fuse it is. But it gets better than that. In Pinball 2000, we do offer an advanced diagnostic system. And if we can get a close-up on the screen, hopefully. Hopefully you can uh, make that out. You can see that uh, F105 is blinking red. George has just created a fuse failure. So um, you don't even necessarily have to go in to find out you have a problem. The game will announce to you, I've got a blown fuse. This is it. Um, you can't really see on the screen the contrast, but the F105 line at the bottom there is in red, where the rest of the lines are in green. Um, who here can read the side of a silver top of a fuse in a dark tavern? to see what the value is after you take it out. Okay, again, the game tells you F105 is a 4-amp fuse. So now George goes into his toolbox, takes a 4-amp fuse out, finds the LED that's out, puts it in next to the LED, and the fuse is replaced. Um, other features of this power driver board, which is right here, uh, it's held down by two screws instead of many all around with a sliding locking system. And it has 22 fewer connectors than the current driver board. So it is very easy and quick and painless to get this in and out of the cabinet, um, which has been a major complaint over the years. Um, on the back, the connection to the rest of the system of the power driver board is through a standard PC parallel port. And what that means to you is your laptop computer is a portable test fixture. If you need to diagnose a problem in a game, you can disconnect the main drive from our system. You connect it to the laptop. You can run a diagnostic program that we provide. It helps you troubleshoot the game. It will help you isolate the problem between the main electronics and the power driver board. Um, and so that, that's a big advantage there. Finally, we have this white cover, and it is permanently attached in the cabinet. You can't get it out. You can't push it out of the way. The only thing you can do with this to put the game back together is put it down where it belongs, and that makes sure that the component tree is protected. All right, we are going to move up in. Oh, we're going to look at some of our uh, some of our other diagnostic tests. Um, here we're in switch tests, and you can see on the right side of the screen it shows a picture of the play field. So again, as the game is working with you um, with its various devices, it, it also graphically is showing you um, where you're dealing with or where the problem is again, to, to help make service easier. Now we're going to move into the back box. OK, we've been using this portable service mirror. This is what you would have in the shop, um, or maybe your service guy would take to the location if he has to go out there. Um, and this lets you view the monitor when the, when the glass is not in place. But every Pinball 2000 has an emergency mirror. That's the back glass. We've provided a good place to put it to keep it out of the way. and. The back glass in place serves as a mirror, and you can run the diagnostics, see the images. It's there, and it's always with the game. Now moving up into the electronic section, George is sliding out the logic box. And again, it slides out for easy access and removal. It just pops out of the game that easily. It's only connected with four connectors, a serial, a parallel, a monitor, and a speaker connector. You pull those off just like you're used to on any computer, and the box comes right out. Again, you can 
throw in other box in your pinball machine, keep it running, and then diagnose it, deal with whatever the issue is when you've got the time and the ability. The um, CPU, the main board in the system, is a commercially available PC motherboard. Um, it is a 233 megahertz Pentium class processor. And among other things, uh, it has a little keyboard slot like every motherboard has, so we wouldn't let that go to waste. By plugging in any commercially available keyboard, um, either this nice portable one that I carry around or just a regular PC keyboard, it plugs in. Um, you get a monitor screen here. You can do uh, various advanced diagnostics. Um, you can also use the keyboard to enter messages and other things that are more naturally done through a keyboard. Um, and we will add more capability to this feature as time goes on. All right, plugged into the motherboard is a PCI card. This plugs into a PCI slot of the motherboard. It contains all the software for the Pinball 2000 machine. Um, the images and the sound data are all on uh, masked ROM chips plugged into the board. But importantly, the game program and the sound program are all on reprogrammable flash memory. This means that the game can be updated without programming EEPROMs and without pulling chips. Um, when we issue an update, your customers will be able to get that update off of our website at pinball.com or they can get the update directly from the, their distributor uh, provided on floppy disk. They then transfer the update to a laptop computer. Laptop computer plugs right into a serial port inside the front door. The update is transferred and it's the Pinball 2000 system puts it in its reprogrammable flash memory and you update the game literally without programming an EEPROM or touching a chip. If you want to go a little higher tech, you insert a modem into the motherboard, attach a phone line, Pinball 2000 will check our website for updates and automatically download and update itself. For some people, this is moving a little too fast. I if your customers aren't quite ready yet to carry around laptop computers, we also can take a step down and you can get chip updates where you take the board out, plug the chips in, it transfers the data, plug the board back in, and we don't know why anybody would want to do this, but we want to let everybody move along with technology at their own rate. Um, George is now, he just installed an update while I was talking, and uh, if some of you saw me walking around with a digital camera this morning, I was taking photos of various of you eating breakfast, and we have made an update that includes those photos, and they will run in the attract mode, and if you can't see it on the camera, that looks like Bob Bulls and Joe Cirillo. I invite everyone to come up and look at the game. And again, we've uh, taken your pictures from breakfast this morning, loaded them into our flash. Now you are live in Pinball 2000, Bob, and I can hit you in the face with the ball. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to open the session to uh, questions right now. And uh, well, I mean, we're gonna we're probably gonna recommend that you turn power off as usual. Uh, hey George. <laughs> yeah, the, the question was, do you have to turn power off when you uh, swap a play field and? Uh, we, I'm sure the service manual will say turn off power <laughs> prior to swapping a play field. But we you know, we recommend know. turning off the power. We're um, here to impress it, you. It, it really, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, we were trying Steve? to impress you. Okay, and you're talking about software updates at this point. The, um, the best and most efficient distribution all around will be electronic, either through email and or the World Wide Web. So when an update becomes available, okay, it goes on our website. And um, let me take a step back to, to how we do it now. Right now, we put it on our website, and then we process through our system 
EPROMs that we send out to you. And the website gets it on Monday, and the EPROMs probably get there a week from Tuesday. Um, so the field is, is getting this information um, long before distribution. Given that we are in the electronic age, and this is really integral to operating Pinball 2000, we need to work with distribution to literally email the updates to you so you have them as soon as they're available. Uh, for many of the customers, uh, when these updates come out, time is very important, particularly if it's a bug fix. And so, you know, we, we want to keep you with us, we want to keep you up to date, and we do need to work uh, to get it to you electronically, right as we're giving it to the world electronically. Modem card, Larry. We'll talk about the modem card, putting the modem card in. Right. Yes. We either, we either send you a floppy and you show up at the location and, and uh, upload it from your computer or, you, or we give you ROMs the old fashioned way and you show up at the location and, and plug them into sockets on the card. Um, it's not necessary but we highly recommend it. Um, the, the answer to that is yes, there is, but it is, the requirement is so low you can't buy one that, that, that doesn't meet it. Um, but again, I'm sorry? I would say any Pentium. Okay, so, uh, which again, they, they haven't made anything less than a Pentium for about two years. Um, but again, if, if, if an operator doesn't have a PC and is reluctant to get a PC, he doesn't have to. The game comes operational, and if he wants to use EPROMs to update, which is how he updates his pinballs today, uh, that's available. We will get you the EPROMs through the normal channels, and, and you'll provide the EPROM to the customer. Um, it won't be as fast just because of the time from us to you and you to them. And again, we have geared this to, to let everyone adapt to the technology at their own rate. Once the operators see the benefits, um, they will run and get a PC. And it's not going to be just this game. The, you know, maybe we're the first w ones that are, that are saying, hey, you're going to really want a PC to operate this game. But this is where we are. Um, many of the video games now uh, are using commercial motherboards, and they're going to if they haven't already been developing these features, we'll be looking hard at this and saying, hey, this is a cool way to operate games. <laughs> um, from the back of the room, the question was, can I use a laptop for any other use besides updates? And I think they, they're uh, trying to stress the point that um, it's a good investment to have a computer for your other business needs. Um, and that you get, if you buy it just for pinball, you get that free, or you can look at buying a laptop because you need one or want one, and then you can use it for your pinball round. Audits and diagnostics. Okay. Um, in addition, thank you. <laughs> uh, that's Tom Uban in back who's uh, setting me up with these questions. He is the chief uh, programmer and system designer of the uh, underlying uh, software in Pinball 2000. Um, we also have uh, in this serial port that's on the front of the game, uh, you can hook your laptop, uh, you can dump uh, diagnostic data, um, auditing data, um, and you can also, again, have access to programs that allow you to do more advanced troubleshooting. So, um, again, as I stress, Pinball 2000 will let everybody move through technology at their own rate, but we believe that people are going to be uh, in a hurry to start uh, using all the new features and capabilities. Mark? Yep. 
The very first thing Neil Castro did when we showed him this thing was ask for a flashlight, at which point he pointed it inside the cabinet and tried to uh, make the image go away. Uh, the image doesn't go away when you do that. Um, obviously, um, I mean, we've got, we've got pretty good lighting we've here. We've and got after a spotlight on the game right you know, now. You guys want to come up here afterwards mm -hmm. and check it out. But uh, um, you can put it in sunlight. You can put it, uh, you know, you can put it almost uh, anywhere you want. I, I suppose if you put it um, outside, um, it, it is going to look uh, more faded than, uh, than it is inside, but uh, I think that 99.9% .9 of your locations aren't going to have any problem. And again, there's a spotlight on the game right now, just for reference. Uh, it really does perform well in, in really any lighting. Ira. I'm going to hand that one over to Mark. Yes, sir. Can you Mark? repeat that, no, no. George? George, can you repeat that for everybody? Yeah, the question was, can you buy the game, or do you have to buy the game, or can you just buy the kit? And, and just to clarify, um, play fields will be available separately starting immediately. And uh, beginning with our second game, there will be kits if, you know, if there is a demand. But no one, I can't see anybody converting a revenge to a new model, you know, three months or four months from now. Ronnie? There will be. There will be a text fi test fixture available for the for the play field. So, uh, to help you do what we said, you know, um, send the seven dollar an hour out guy out to the location, have him swap the play field, and keep the the expensive technician back in the shop and let him do what he does, as opposed to you know making him drive there and take it out. And it's really I I mean it's pretty easy to take it out as you saw. So. Um, domestically, we're expecting it to be 50 cents a play, two for a dollar as a factory setting. Yes, we do. Um, the, uh, something we didn't talk about is uh, the cabinet has a back door. It's key to like uh, with this key right here. It allows you to uh, get the monitor out, essentially Match. four bolts, and the entire monitor comes out the back. It is also vented. In addition to that, there's a fan in the power supply box of the of the PC right in here, venting out. Um, and of course, we've you know we've uh, we've tested it, and we have absolutely no heat problems with it whatsoever. Back there, yes, sir. 
Um, there is the standard, uh, the standard location, the standard amount of we space. We've been uh, putting Mars and Dixie Narco um, acceptors in with up stackers in with no problem. Sir, you had a question. Yes, we've uh, we've talked about it. We've talked about a container uh, to help us in in getting playfields to you, and also we probably if we did that, we'd make that container available to you so you'd handle playfields. Um, we've you know we've talked about a variety of options. Something reflecting a standard tool case, uh, you know, with wheels to allow you to wheel it around. Um, another thing. Um, the, the spacing between the skids is designed uh, such that it fits in a standard uh, two-wheeler. Um, so we've, uh, we've tried, and, and the fact that um, you know, we, have, we have gotten a consensus from all of the designers, and there is no mechanism that will exceed this dimension <laughs> so that you know, we, can, uh, we can do that with a play field, which we could never do before. Um, so it was a wrestling match, but we made a rule. And for, the, for those inquiring minds, it's probably easier to tackle world peace than getting all the designers at Williams to agree on something. So a ski rack wouldn't be the optimal way to transport the uh, uh, It field. will yeah. go on a ski on rack. On top of the car. It will go on a ski rack. It would look cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have one quick question. I, I don't know the answer to this. You did a transfer of one play field, the same tr play field from one to just ch changed revenge. Play fields. If you had to change game play fields or change the game on location, can you do that? And how long would that take? It's it's exactly the same. The um, the all of the custom cabling on Pinball 2000 occurs on the play field. Every Pin 2000 cabinet and platform is cabled identically. So um, that means that essentially this bank of connectors that you saw me fooling with is going to be the same on every Pinball 2000. And and the you know the same procedure that I just did, the most time-consuming thing will be putting decals on the cabinet. I mean, you're going to do which uh, again, if, if you're if you're rotating, you would have standard decals. Um, if you're upgrading, you would want to apply new decals, or you could s you could go to standard decals. Um, that's something that uh, we're going to work with and, and find the best way to operate. Um, the rest of the conversion, since we've demonstrated everything else, um, software is contained in this board. You saw George pull the drawer out, one screw, and I've now taken the software out of the game. I take the software, the play field, and the back glass, and swap the other that's, one in and That's I'm your done. kit, and a roll of decals. That's your kit. Um, uh, I'm not the warranty guy, uh, Mark or Ken or somebody. Can you repeat that? How expensive oh. is the playfield? How much more expensive is the playfield glass than a standard pinball glass? Um, you can see that the glass. I don't know if you can see this, but you see that the glass is uh, is tinted, right? That's the magic of pinball 2000. I mean, the whole the whole trick is uh, reflecting the image off of the top surface of the glass and uh, onto the play field. Um, you'll also see at the bottom of the glass, there are two stripes. You're looking at the checkerboards, which means you're looking at the back side of the glass. The front side of the glass has the smiley faces and uh, arrows that say coin door this end. If you get this in wrong, your game's not gonna blow up. You're just gonna have a fuzzy image. 
So in an attempt to get you to get it in right, also when you look through this, if you look closely, there is a Pinball 2000 logo uh, screened into the lower right-hand corner, and we hope that you can read that after you've installed the glass. Um, the glass is, has a special coating which um, is graduated so that at the bottom of the play field you, you have a perfectly clear piece of glass and at the top of the play field you have a darker piece of glass. This glass is about five times more expensive than our current glass the last time I looked. And somebody else can, you know, if, if, if anybody in the audience from WMS has a better answer, please feel free. But I, I seem to recall that the number was five times. It's about five times the cost. I don't know how that will translate into a part sales cost. Um, you've seen, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's been a lot of traffic on um, the internet about the size of the game. Um, the play fields are precisely three inches shorter than our previous play fields. Um, the, the cabinet, uh, accordingly, is also shorter. Um, the reason the play fields are shorter um, by the way, that's one inch longer than a high speed. Um, just to put it in reference of, ga of a game that you would know. Black Knight, high speed, any of the games from that era were 42 inches long. This play field is 43 inches long. Um, the reason it was done is for a manufacturing economy relative to the size of the cabinet. Um, that's why it was done. It wasn't done for any other reason. Um, the designers got together and we played around with the um, architecture of the play field to try to retain uh, the Williams feel, the Williams pinball feel in the play field, and we think we've done that. You know, I, you guys had a, an opportunity to shoot the game. It is three inches shorter than my Monster Bash, um, but, um, and accordingly, you can't accidentally, you're also accidentally not going to fit the glass from my Monster Bash in your pin 2000. So. Uh, you're not going to be able to switch glass accidentally, and, in, and um, in some ways that's a good thing because the glass is tinted special so that Pinball 2000 does what it does. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, Um, yeah, I'll let Larry tackle the brand name question on the monitor and I'll address the flipper power. Um, at Williams, uh, some of you know or may not know, um, the designers essentially have a range of five flipper coil strengths to work with. And it is designer's choice and we have not taken that away. Um, Revenge from Mars began with our second to the strongest coil on flippers up until uh, about two weeks ago, in which I determined that the games on location were getting so much play. They were literally, um, literally constantly played all day long, so that a guy who was there in the location at 10 o'clock at night was having trouble scoring the center ramp because the flippers were so hot. So I went up a coil strength uh, to our most powerful flipper coil, and that has fixed that. So the, the flipper coil situation, um, we are we are sort of routinely going through, now that we've got the platform done and we've taken care of some of these platform issues, we are routinely going through all of the mechanisms that you know of as standard mechanisms on a pinball machine and we are giving them the same amount of attention that we've given the platform. Um, one of the very first things that, that, that is on our agenda, we started improving the flippers, but we realized that flippers are troublesome and we are going to design flippers that are as reliable as the rest of Pinball 2000. We just haven't had a lot of time, and the platform has been the thing that's going to keep us alive, and so we've focused our attention on that. We've gone to a single tool tightening sequence for a flipper bat, and we intend to take the entire assembly and put the combined power of the engineering department behind that thing and make it the most reliable flipper assembly that we can invent. What, one thing you'll notice on the Revenge from Mars playfield, it is mechanically much simpler than a, what is a standard pinball play field today. Um, this makes the game just inherently more reliable because instead of mechanisms with gears and motors, um, we are doing a lot of our mechanisms as virtual mechanisms on the screen. Um, from an engineering point of view, this gives our mechanical engineering department less toys to design for each game, and we now have them focused on some of the standard items 
um, most notably the jet bumpers, the ball trough, and the flippers, to bring them up a level of quality so that we can make this thing really even more reliable, more bulletproof. Uh, monitor, uh, monitor brands. Um, we're currently using a Wells Gardner 7300, and we are evaluating other uh, manufacturers' monitors for this purpose. It is a CGA low-res uh, type of monitor. Uh, that's built in Korea. No. Any Windex, anything you currently use to clean glass? Nope. And I do like to show people these rails. They uh, protect the components on the game. First uh, time he did that to me in London, I... <laughs> <laughs> But literally, it, it again, it uh, pinball machines were a little harder to handle in the past, and this again is is a, a big step forward. Yeah, we probably can. Um, and there is a uh, question. What was the question? I'm sorry. The, uh, que the question is. Parts. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. Question is: Is there a spare parts package, and can we make it available to distribution? Um, we have created a spare parts package that I think is a package for every hundred games, and you get, you know, a bunch of, you know, you get driver boards, um, PCI boards, playfield glasses, and all the components that are new in various quantities. And that's uh, on the again, I'm not sure exactly how Mark is working it, but I know on the initial orders for every hundred games ordered, you will get one parts package. Um, you'll get the, you'll get it probably around the time the first games are shipped, and domestically, um, that's that's a slam dunk. Okay, before we uh, we wrap this up, I just want to remind everybody that we've got a lot of meetings this afternoon, so you'll be able to meet with these personnel. Uh, Mark's got something to say, Mark. sheet oh, hello. you got an information sheet that explained uh, the event where it was being held the time um, we're mailing tickets out tonight to you um, so that you'll have them to give to your to your customers and if we ask we're asking you to send us back information about when your who's coming from your company and who's coming from your customers and that will go out with the tickets so if you just want to fill that out and send that back to us it would be very helpful to us and in addition to your uh, answer your question, we are planning on having George and Larry in our booth at the show floor at ASI.
Okay, um, I, let me just ask one final question. I, I hate to ask a stupid question, and I'll ask it as nice as I can, the nicest way. It, the question that somebody, I'm sure, has in their mind here goes something like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. But does it collect? Or will game, it collect? This Are game you rocks. This game rocks. Talk to your salespeople. We've, we've uh, only been on test a couple of weeks at a, at a, across two locations, but every one of these locations um, have exceeded our expectations. Um, so I, I, I think the sales guys have earnings reports for both locations. Both locations are here, and you're welcome uh, to drop by and, and see these things in action. It is, um, it, it, it's been really kind of cool and something I've never seen in my time in pinball uh, to see a crowd around a pinball machine. Um, I, I really have never experienced this in my five years designing pinball machines. Uh, and if you go to uh, diversions uh, off of McCormick between Devon and Lincoln and walk in there and check that out uh, or go out to Just for Fun and watch people uh, at diversions, we're getting, um, and this is just a gut feel thing from standing back and watching the game, but we're probably getting at least 50% of our play, if not more, is coming from video game players. Guys that are not familiar with the conventions of pinball. I saw two guys trading balls on a one-player game, and after they got done with that game, they coined up again. They, they, were, uh, they spent just as much money, but they didn't know how to orchestrate uh, a two-player game. Um, uh, they also don't know how to uh, even begin to attempt to save the ball, and this is another telltale sign. <laughs> they can make the shots and turn stuff on, but they, they haven't figured out that they can bump the machine and try to, try to uh, save the ball. So we're getting a lot, of, a lot of what we anticipated. To bring this market back, we have to have new players. We have to have players that haven't played pinball. We can't rely on, on our little fan base that we've been living on for the last five years, which is a fan base that is dwindling. You know, these guys, are, they're, they're going to be my age, and they're getting married, and they're not hanging out in the bars anymore and whatever. What, and one, thing uh, one thing you will see that we didn't really touch on, um, in this game, the whole center of the play field is wide open and a ball shot up the center, which is where your new players tend to send the ball, always does something. And this is designed so that people who see the cool video, see this new game, they try it, they have a positive experience. Their games aren't really long, but they never would be on a pinball machine. They get on it, they spend 50 cents, we're not raising the price, and they have a positive experience, and we're getting younger players and we're getting video game players and, and that's been very successful, and you'll see our designs um, providing a good experience for everyone, and then still all the depth and richness that we put in our Williams rules for the real pinball players. In, in a monster bash, you have to hit the, the targets below Frankenstein six times to bring Frankenstein down and create something cool. The very first thing that you see that's cool takes you six shots to the same bank of targets. In a Pinball 2000, any shot will show you something cool. Um, that was our design premise when we sat down, and, and what we tried to do was orchestrate that, um, that progression of cool so that you're going to see something cool right away, and hopefully after you've hit something six times, that thing is six times cooler than the first one that you saw. So we still plan to evolve the, uh, ex the play experience the same way we always did, but we want to bring you into it a lot faster than we ever did before. Yeah. And, and if Jim's not ready to give us the hook, one more thing. Um, this is a new technology with new possibilities. Every designer, every programmer that has touched this or looked at this goes, oh, you could do this, or oh, I could put this there, or I could meld the scenery, or I could um, do this or that. Um, Revenge from Mars, we're going to look back on this in two years and go, wow, that crude game, um, the evolution of what we're developing is dramatic and will be remarkable. I don't know if uh, we made the point. We've done everything we can to make the point about it. Um, these guys have, there's probably 30 people who have been involved for over a year and a half. And trying 45. 45 people. That's 45. Uh, in putting this together. And... Uh, the point isn't just that this thing has been designed uh, by these guys that are they who have, have have tried to reinvent the industry. The fact is is that they have. The games are out there on location, and they're earning, and they're doing very well. 
And um, the one point I'd like to make is when we started this presentation, we talked about the future and uh, designing the future and not being a victim and just grabbing it and going. And these guys and the other people there have uh, done a fantastic job. And I think uh, I'd like to ask for a round of applause for their efforts. Larry DeMar and George Gomez, they'll be around so you can ask some questions of them later. Uh, let me just remind you about what our schedule is here. Uh, we have at 11.45, which is in 15 minutes, give you time to do a few things, uh, we have lunch. And lunch is going to be in the next room, right? At 11.45, uh, lasts for an hour or so. I believe your first meeting is at 1 o'clock, is that correct, Mark? 1 o'clock is the first meetings, and people, you should all, everybody should know when their meetings are during the day. I think we have meetings between 1 and 5 o'clock. Do you hear music? Oh, yeah. And uh, after that, at 7 o'clock, we'll have dinner uh, very in the same room. Actually, this wall will be gone. And in these two rooms, we'll have dinner at 7 o'clock tonight. You know, there's nothing better than, a, than after a hard day of focusing on creating the future than a little bit of entertainment and a little bit of uh, comedy, fun, and dinner. So at 7 o'clock... After your meetings, after your hard-focused work, please return here. We have a couple things. We have a, a local Chicago comedian who's fantastic. And we also have, if you're all staying here, maybe you saw on the hotel channel, something that uh, we Chicagoans are very proud of called Second City, uh, which is where a lot of uh, great comedians got their start. John Belushi and Bill Murray and all of these guys from SCTV and so forth. You've seen them all before. Anyway, we've got a, a comedy troupe coming in this evening, and uh, they're from Second City, and uh, you won't want to miss that either. So we'll see you back here for dinner at 7 o'clock. Enjoy your symposium, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>